So, in the in the this is as we keep um, reminding ourselves is a big part of of it is spiritual and big part of it is theological understanding. We are covering the Holy Spirit because it is part of understanding the salvation, how God has prepared for us, um, all of us, to have communion. And the communion is the is the, our transfiguration. We reach the mountain of salvation when we're all able to have communion. And we covered the communion quite a bit. We covered the, the, Holy, the baptism. And, and now we're in the series of covering the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is, I think, is undermined in our readings, although he's the one who did everything. Uh, wrote the Bible, uh, sanctified us, enabled us to become Christians, enabled us to be able to be eligible for the communion, um, was the, is the author of handling the material, is the author of handling the, the teaching, is the author of handling the speaking in tongues, is the author of handling of handling the communication with us through God, because he is God who communicates with us. Um, and we see the Father communicates through the Son, and in order for this communication to be sustained, that you don't forget what God says, we need God, the Holy Spirit, to live in us. So we undermine quite a bit because we say our Father who art in heaven, and we go to communion, and we always, some, not always, at least for myself, forget that I have God in me all the time. And that is... That is what makes a Christian person unique. Unique is a very understatement. Uh, when you know that God is living in you and he will never leave you no matter what sins you have committed. He just, his voice goes lower. But whenever you wake him up and ask him to lead, he'll say, here I am. Um, so it's amazing how, how easy it is um, to enjoy our, our Christianity by living uh, with the Holy Spirit. So don't forget, we don't want this to be academic, we want it to be very spiritual. We want to be led by the Spirit, as the first verse of Romans 8 tells us. Um, those who walk in the Spirit, not in the flesh. But the beauty of the Bible is that all of this plan was hidden in the Old Testament. It's not fulfilled. So the Old Testament is, is the allegory or the typology of, or the shadow of the real things, as St. Paul calls him in Hebrews chapter 8. Unfortunately, Christians today avoid theological studies and they love sermons about spirituality and they call it more practical. That is, that is a big mistake uh, because if, the, if we don't understand our faith, our communion in itself is not going to work because we say amen to a certain theology that we believe in. And uh, uh, we love more importantly, some, this is more in, in, um, in our culture sometimes that we love more stories about miracles more than uh, theological understanding of the Bible. Uh, not wrong, but you're setting yourself up for shallowness, not depth. Um, that you just focus on a spiritual talk because it's always easier. Um, I, I like us that we take the high ground or the more difficult part, which is really understanding our faith and make the Bible a pleasure through understanding it. And that's why, please, we're not doing academic stuff here. We're doing the application and how we take this and repent with it. But um, spiritual talks are pleasurable, but if we also respond, always only respond to spiritual talks, we will not grow in knowledge. <clears throat> and knowledge is a big, big part of our faith, um, because this is the way to be able to defend the faith. If we don't have knowledge, we can be swayed in any direction. And that is, as you have noticed, the focus of our um, Bible pleasure is to, um, is to enjoy the Bible more by understanding more. And if anything misunderstood, please, we can sit up after it to discuss it further. For those who are joining us uh, in, the, in the middle of the series, um, all of the lessons are on the website of the church, the coc.org. Um, and in order to catch quickly, you don't have to listen to everything, just the first three, the first three um, talks, the introduction and lesson one and lesson two. Uh, it will give you the big umbrella or the panoramic view of what this is and I, it's a new lens that will make the bible much more understood and much more pleasurable and you'll understand it more if you even if you read the paragraph that's on the website actually it's a, um, let me open it quickly so here and on 
end of this So to get on board very quickly, it's, it's a, this video, the introduction is 12 minutes long. This is actually the whole core that holds this approach that we're using here. And then lesson one um, is the, what is the problem that God is trying to solve? Are we in a problem? Are we in trouble? That is covered in lesson one. And then the solution to it in a very big picture is lesson two. And this is how actually anybody can grasp any topic. You have to have the bird view of it and then you can get into the details. Um, and please, this is choosing this approach for us to understand the Old Testament. As you notice, I focus a lot on the Old Testament because people say, where do I start reading from? Um, the, the, the approach we're using here is also giving an, a, a sequence of the chapters we, we use to understand our salvation. Um, and since our salvation is fulfilled in communion, so I give it a big part for it. And we covered a certain book to explain to us communion from the Old Testament, the book of Song of Songs. And then we focus on baptism. And then now we're focusing on the Holy Spirit. The three of them in the Old Testament, because it makes the Old Testament an extremely pleasurable book to read, because it's amazing that all of it is in there before it happened. So don't shy away from the Old Testament. And I think. Um, um, this, hopefully this uh, will help you. And each lesson should have a handout. Um, and, and this is a video of it and should have notes. And we are now in this series of the Holy Spirit. So let's get back here. we covered, um, if we go to page one, we have covered the work of the Holy Spirit in Genesis, the two main verses that the Holy Spirit was hovering over the surface of the water. And we said this proves that the Holy Spirit as the water was covering the whole earth, the Holy Spirit sanctified the earth before we lived in it, before God did anything of the creation. God, the Holy Spirit, sanctified the world by the world being completely under, and notice the link between water and the Holy Spirit. It's, 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 it tells us how our salvation in the New Testament has to be linked to the work of the water spirit, of the Holy Spirit on water. Second creation of man, Genesis 2, 7, that the breathing of God in us is the breathing of giving us the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And we lost this when the fall happened. That's why Adam and Eve were naked and not ashamed. And when they fell, they became ashamed because the Holy Spirit left them. So the, 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 the grace for us now is that no matter what sins you have committed, even if it's adultery, the Holy Spirit will not leave you. Of course, that's not encouragement to fall, but it's in, it's a it's a uplifting for us no matter what you are still, still a son and daughter of god um and then several verses uh, we we covered you can lead it at your leisure at home but i want us to jump to the end of page one we have empowered individuals to do the task ahead uh, and this we covered unique um people the, the most important one for them is samson and we said that Samson's strength came from the Holy Spirit coming upon him, not from the hair. The hair is a sign for him that he is a Nazarite. Um, this is in Judges 13, that he is a Nazarite to the Lord. Page two. We discussed a, a giant figure in the Old Testament. That is Joseph. Joseph has been sold by his brothers and he kept quiet even while he's being sold. That is very, very amazing. He could have said something to the Ishmaelites, but he was quiet. The work of the Holy Spirit in Joseph, we discussed it last time, as the dreams, the dreams that he was able to dream by the gift of the Holy Spirit, because they had a point, they had a, they had a topic for them. It was not just a, to show he's going to be a, uh, above his brothers, um, but the way he stated it made his brother jealous of him. So sometimes you might be disliked by people not being your fault you're doing everything right and somehow there is animosity people are moved by jealousy or my moved by envy and you, all of a sudden you find yourself under attack and you just say what did i do wrong well, the answer you didn't do anything wrong but that's because there is evil in the world innocent people will be sometimes 
almost 100% will be persecuted. Let's open Numbers 11, 17. I know it's written here, the passage we won't read, but I'd like us that we open the, the Bible and I want us to read the book of Numbers and focus on that chapter a little bit. Reading for us, please yeah. read from the very the very beginning of Numbers 11, um, because it gives us an amazing context for understanding. And uh, mm -hmm. uh, we'll read. I want to read. Uh, um, till the seventy elders. So till verse nine. Now the people complain. Displeased the Lord. The Lord heard it, and his anger was aroused. So the fire of the Lord burned among them and consumed some in the outskirts of the camp. Then the people cried out to Moses, and when Moses prayed to the Lord, the fire was quenched. So he called the name of the place Tibera, uh, because the fire of the Lord had burned among them. So Tibera means fire, literally. Now the mixed multitude who were among them yielded to intense craving. So the children of Israel also wept again and said, Who will give us to eat? We remember the fish which we ate freely in Egypt, the cucumbers, the melons, the leeks, the onions, and the garlic. But now our whole being is dried up. There is nothing at all except this manna before our house. So they're complaining about what? Food. Yeah, what type of food? Bread. The manna. <laughs> Same menu every day. But the manna is coming from heaven. So sometimes we come to church and say we do the same liturgy every day. Every so there's nothing different. So let us not fall into the trap, complaining that it's the same liturgy every week. But remember, what's the end of the liturgy? You get the Lord Himself. So God was He happy with this complaining? He wasn't happy. Why wasn't He happy? They did not appreciate that without this food coming from heaven, they would have been what? Dead. 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 What is the other option? <laughs> what is the other option if you don't have communion? God will not abide in you. And the Holy Spirit, yes, lives in us, but he needs Christ to come. So we can say, our Father who art in heaven, you're, you're in link with the Holy Trinity himself. Because in Genesis 1, 26, this is the beauty of the of the of, of the faith it's not it's not a faith it is the only logical relationship between god and man creation in fulfillment or being trinity like god is when we damage this nature god fixed it and he gave us full restoration to what we were before so he's saying it's the same pattern that i have seen after the fall in mankind. And that's why the renewal was not only a renewal of, of the humankind, but the renewal of the way of thinking. And we see this falling over and over in the Old Testament. God was very patient with it. If you think God of the Old Testament, I don't want to open this discussion now, but being accused of being harsh and even different one than the old than the new, this is a heresy, of course, by Novatian that claimed that it's not the same one. You'll see here that God is very, very, very patient because he's saving their life in the desert, that they don't die. None of their sandals go worn out. None of their tunics are, are worn out. Um, they get food freely every day. Never runs out. Whatever they collect, it's enough for them. And now they want a change of the menu. Because sometimes when God satisfies us, instead of saying thank you, we start looking for what's missing. And that is, that's a plague of all of us, of all of us. Mm -hmm. It's not here to rebuke at all, but to remember that God gets a little bit disappointed in his children. When we don't count our blessing, we count our missings, what we're lacking. And here's one person told for me once, um, just a, his death on the cross is enough. Everything else is a bonus <laughs> because what is the other option? Death. And he took us out of this death. So everything we have in life, we, we don't deserve it. It's just a gift because he did his part. I mean, he created and we fell. He saved and we're complaining. What, what can he do more? And so he said this in the, 
in, in St. Luke, that uh, since St. John the Baptist, you say he has a demon. I, I, I come eating and drinking with sinners, of course, to save them, not for social gathering. And you say he's a glutton and wine bibber. Wisdom is justified by her people. So wisdom is good, but unfortunately, it cannot be labeled on you. There's other people that justifies what wisdom is. So we need to be wise about this. And, and again, if we fall in any of this weakness, and me first among you, uh, we just tell God, please let me let me look at what would it be if I miss out these blessings, not what I need more. Um, okay, Sean, please continue. <laughs> the man of like coriander seed, and its color like the color of fidelium. The people went about and gathered it, ground it on millstones, or beat it in the mortar, cooked it in pans, and made cakes of it. And its, taste, and its taste was like the taste of pastry prepared with oil. When the dew fell in the camp of the night, the manna fell on it. Yeah. So God is describing to us that this is, yes, basic, basic food, but without it, they would have died. So now all of the people are complaining. <laughs> we need new food, and Moses is just, what, what do I do? You know, this is like more than a million people in front of them. They want another type of food. So God hearing that you are in need to make decisions, so he, he gets, gives him a solution. So let's continue from verse 10. What is the solution that God gave? And it will involve very, 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 very much the work of the Holy Spirit. And I hope you're related to something in the, um, in the New Testament. Did we read 10? Uh, not yet. Well, okay. Yeah. Uh, we'll read from, from 10 on. Okay. Then Moses heard the people weeping throughout their families, everyone at the door of his tent, and the anger of the Lord was greatly aroused. Why are they weeping? <laughs> yeah, another menu. They're so upset that they're crying because they have to eat the same thing every day. We, we, we do the same thing. We have to get something different on the menu, especially in fasting time. <laughs> we weep. <laughs> <laughs> Is God upset or not? I can't tell. <laughs> okay, let's continue. Moses also was displeased. So Moses said to the Lord, Why have you afflicted your servants? Why have I not found favor in your sight, that you have laid the burden of these people on me? Did I conceive all these people? Did I beget them, that you should say to me, carry them in uh, your bosom, as a guardian carries a nursing child to the land which he swore to their fathers? Where am I to get meat uh, to give to all these people? For they weep all over me, saying, Give us meat that we may eat. What type of prayer is this? We have to, to God, God, God accepts our <coughs> prayers. So what type of prayer is Moses giving here? Lamentation? How? Is that Emily speaking? Mm -hmm. how, how, Emily, is it lamentation? You know, this, um, like lamenting even like why why are we giving me this why are we giving me this burden why are we giving me these people not their mother <laughs> <laughs> okay what else do you guys agree it's lamentation or something else kind of confronting God confronting how um he's telling you know he's asking God, why he, you know, gave him this burden in the sense of, you know, you're the one who gave him this burden, and he's kind of upset with God. Okay. What else? Um, hmm? So what is what is the characteristic of? Because Psalms have joyful, have pleading, have meekness, have needing help. Did I beget them that you should say to me, carry them in your bosom as a guardian carries a nursing child to the land you swore to the fathers? It's telling God, basically, the responsibility you give me is above me. I, I can't do it. How, how, can I, how can I give food that are, for people who are crying for me for food and there are that many? So God accepts our frustration when we go to him with that frustration. He's not upset with Moses. In fact, he will solve the problem for him. So when, when you, but you go to God. When you go to God being frustrated with God, he's okay with it. 
But when you go to the devil, being frustrated with God, that is the problem. So God is not frustrated when you are frustrated with him. He accepts this 100% because he knows the burden you're carrying. He knows it's heavy. And he loves that you plead with him so that I can interfere to carry that burden. What I do sometimes, when I'm upset with God, I go to the devil. And this is where the destruction happens quickly and for sure. So, yes, Moses is upset. Moses frustrated. But did he abandon God? No, he prayed. So, complain to God about God. Don't complain. Don't go to the open arms of the devil to complain about God. Because this is his trick. He puts a wedge between you and God. He accuses God in your eyes and we, we respond to him. So you'll see now the work of the Holy Spirit will start happening amazingly to save him from this. And this is what prayer does, especially with the Akbay, is that the Holy Spirit will give words, will give feelings, will give mindset that will be answering exactly what you're going through if we believe in it. Okay. I'm not able to bear all these people alone because the burden is too heavy for me. If you treat me like this, please kill me here and now. <laughs> if I have found favor in your sight, and do not let me see my wretchedness. So the Lord said to Moses, Gather to me seventy men of the elders of Israel, whom you know to be the elders of the people, and officers over them. Okay. Gather to me, he did not say gather to you, which means, yes, Moses, it is my problem. I'll take it over. What did the prayer do? He told him, kill me. <laughs> I can't be mistreated further. <laughs> Sounds familiar? <laughs> I think all of us relate to this. It's that you reach a point says, it's my death is better than my life. And all of the saints of the Bible reached it. They did. But they reached and they went to God with it. They did not go to the devil to, with the solution, which is what I do wrong if I go to the devil for a solution. Once God says, gather for me or my father's house, is a holy house and you made it the house of merchandise, or my house, Christ claimed the house to be his father's and his. Once they kept refusing him to enter the temple in, in terms of renewing their mind, then he said, your house is left for you. This okay, you kick me out, I'm out. It's longer. So the response of God, is, when he says gather for me, is completely different than gather for you. He owns it. He takes the problem. And, and there's no way you go to God with a problem and says, it's not my problem, it's yours. Even when we mask everything completely, it's still, he never, he never bails out. He never does. Okay. Continue, Sean, please. Uh, gather to me 70 men of the elders of Israel whom you know to be the elders of the people and officers over them. Bring them to the tabernacle meeting that they may stand there with you. And I will come down and talk with you there. I will take uh, of the spirit that is upon you and will pull this, put the same spirit upon them. They shall bear in, uh, the burden of the people with you, that you may not bear it yourself alone. That is the punchline. What is happening here? God is taking, does Moses have a spirit? Who, who, who is the spirit that God will take from Moses? From Moses, from what's on Moses and give it to the other 70. And what does that mean? And who is that spirit? The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. So, and this is how the 70 elders will have the same way of thinking as Moses does, because they are led by one, one what? One spirit. Romans 8 verse 1, there is no condemnation now on those who are in Jesus Christ, who are led, who are walk according to the spirit, not according to the flesh. And the spirit here means the Holy Spirit. So what is the solution? Yes, I will give, you need, you need help. That burden, you need, you need help with it. Why the number 70? Where do we see that elsewhere? Where do we see this in the New Testament fulfilled? The disciples sent out. The, the apostles, yeah. The apostles are 70 apostles that will help in the ministry of the church. So God is solving the problem and he will give him people to help him and they will not think worse. But he tells them, you choose them. I trust your choice. You choose the people whom you think that they're worthy of this. And the choice was not debated by God. He did not eliminate any of them. 
and he gave them the Spirit, the Holy Spirit that was on Moses to guide this to be on God. So the Holy Spirit guided Moses that whenever he reached the end of his rope, he would go to God. The one time he didn't, God told him because of this, he would not be able to enter the promised land, which is he, the anger took over more and he struck the, the rock. Okay, let's continue. Then you shall say to the people, Consecrate yourselves for tomorrow, and you shall eat meat. For you have wept in the hearing of the Lord, saying, Who will give us meat to eat? For it was well with us in Egypt. Therefore the Lord will give you meat, and you shall eat. You shall eat not one day, nor two days, nor five days, nor ten days, nor twenty days, but for a whole month, until it comes out of your nostrils and becomes loathsome to you, because you have despised the Lord who is among you, and have wept before him, saying, why did we ever come up out of Egypt? You want meat? I'll give you meat. <laughs> God is not happy. But he's telling you, you prayed for this, you want this so much, I'll give it to you and you'll find out it's not good for you. You'll actually, will, you look at it and you'll vomit by the end of that period you have the meat for. So, um, God is, is, saying, is saying to all of us, I know what's good for you, more than you, what you think is good for you. Do you think I don't know what's good for you? Do you think you know more? Um, so God is, is <clears throat> disappointed in the lack of trust and the lack of faith. How does the faith increase? When the Holy Spirit who lives in you is taking over, literally leading. And this will happen when? When you pray and read the Bible. Because these are two communication modes. The Holy Spirit wrote the Bible and the Holy Spirit wrote that prayer. One is this direction, praying, and the other one is in this direction. You're receiving the salvation of God through the scriptures. So um, this is, let's go back to the handout, but this is the part that I just wanted to show you how separate things here he takes from the spirit of that's on Moses and puts on the 70 elders. Let's jump to Numbers 27. We're still on page two of the handout. It's just one line, but I would like us also to read Numbers 27. The same concept of the Holy Spirit is the one who does the leadership. So when Moses has a, a leader, there's a leader that will continue after him. That leader also has to be led by the Holy Spirit. So we'll see this in Numbers 27. It's on page two uh, that you have. Handout. Go to verse uh, 12. Yeah, you read for us. Sure. I'm going to read from 12. Now the Lord said to Moses, Go up into this Mount Abarim and see the land which I have given to the children of Israel. But when you have seen it, you also shall be gathered to your people as Aaron your brother was gathered. For in the wilderness of Zin, during the strife of the congregation, you rebelled against my command to hallow me at the waters before their eyes. These are the waters of Meribah and Kadesh in the wilderness of Zin. Then Moses spoke to the Lord, saying, Let the Lord, the God of the spirits of all flesh, set a man over the congregation, who may go out before them and go in before them, who may lead them out and bring them in, that the congregation of the Lord may not be like sheep which have no shepherd. And the Lord said to Moses, Take Joshua the son of Nun with you, a man in whom is the spirit and lay your hand on him. Set him before Eleazar the priest and before all the congregation and inaugurate him in their sight. And you shall give some of your authority to him that all the congregation of the children of Israel may be obedient. He shall stand before Eleazar the priest who shall inquire before the Lord for him by the judgment of the Urim. The Urim. At this word they shall go out and at his word they shall come in he and all the children of israel with them all the congregation okay so the verse we can see here verse 18 take joshua the son of Nun, with you a man in whom is the spirit and lay your hand on them so what the church does in the book of acts is not something strange but the disciples now who understand the old testament they see what the difference is that that this moses is able to not give the Holy Spirit, but the Holy Spirit will come from the Lord, but the sign of giving, because Moses has no authority to give the Holy Spirit, the sign of giving is the laying of, of the hand, which we see consistently in the New Testament. So 
when we when we read the New Testament and we don't have these pictures already available in the Old Testament, they were not they were real they were real typology. Typology is, by the way, allegory is something non tangible that represents something non tangible in the New in the New Testament. Typology means something or someone tangible in the Old Testament represents someone or something tangible in the New Testament. So this is allegory. Uh, sorry, typology. As uh, Joseph was a typology of Christ, Moses is a typology, a type of Christ. Um, so here we see this action is typology of, or a type of, the laying of the Holy Spirit, giving the Holy Spirit, but now the authority of the disciples to give it, because, to give him, sorry, not to give it, to give him, to whoever they put their hand on them. And now um, we, we see it in the church that's given um, through the Holy Chrismation. There's a very unknown judge. We don't hear his name, his name often, so I wanted to give him some credit today. His name is Othniel, and it's in Judges 3. So let's read about this Othniel a little bit. Um, and we can read from verse one, please. <clears throat> now these are the nations which the Lord left that He might let that He might test Israel by them. That is, all who all who had not known any of the wars in Canaan. This was the only. This was only so that the gen the generations of the children of Israel might be taught to know war at, le at least those who had not formerly known it. Namely, five lords of the Philistines, all the Canaanites, the Sidians, the Hivites, and who dwelt in the in Mount Lebanon, from Mount Baal, Hermon, to the entrance of Hamath. And they were left that he might test Israel by them to know whether they would obey the commandments of the Lord, which he commanded, which he commanded their fathers by the hand of Moses. Thus the children of Israel dwelt among the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites, the Hivites and the, Je the Jebusites. And they took the daughters to the, and they took their daughters to be their wives and gave their daughters to sons and they served their gods. So the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. They so the mixed marriages that happened between the children of Israel and the children of the land, the promised land. And God told them, actually, I'm sending you to receive this land, not because of your righteousness. He said this in Deuteronomy, uh, Deuteronomy 8 and 9. And he warned them very much. If you do the abominations of the people in the land, they are doing it, the land will vomit you out. So... I'm sending you to clean it. These people were horrific. And now they are mixing in marriage with them. And this is where they lose God. And that's the cycle of judges. God sends a judge to save them because they cry out to God. And then after God saves them, they fall back again into the same problem, emotional attachment to the wrong people. Even if their God is not the same God, it doesn't matter. And they fall into captivity and they scream and God sends another judge it shows really the mercy of God. No matter how, how they mess up, God sends someone to save them. And the mess up will happen in Samuel, even at the bigger scale, but we'll see. So let's see this, um, his, just to recognize this unknown name. And he's sent to save the people from the evil they are falling in. Let's continue. Let's so the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. They forgot the, they forgot the Lord and their God and served the Baals and the... Asherahs. Therefore, the anger of the Lord was hot against Israel, and he sold them into the hand of the Kushan Rishathim, king of Mesopotamia. And the children of Israel served Kushan Rishathim eight years. When the children of Israel cried out to the Lord, the Lord raised up a deliverer for the children of Israel, who delivered them, Othniel. 
the son of Kenaz, Caleb's younger brother. The Spirit of the Lord came upon him, and he judged Israel. Okay, so the same common theme here, the Spirit of the Lord came upon him. Let's jump to Judges um, 6. We'll see a famous judge now, Gideon. And he's going to ask God uh, for something that's not very familiar as a sign because he, he, will, he will do a miraculous work. He doesn't know that he will do the miraculous work, but it will, he will win uh, with 300 men over an army that is, it says, as much as the sand of the sea without even having one weapon. Um, the story of it is in Judges 6, but I'm not going to read it. I just want to read the sign that he asked of the Lord and what typology does it have in the New Testament. Um, and I hope it will whet your appetite to see how the, Holy, the New Testament is hidden in the New. Um, <clears throat> so Gideon said to God, I'm reading from verse 36, Judges 6, 36. So Gideon said to God, if you save Israel by my hand, as you said, then look, I shall put a fleece of wool on the threshing floor. If there is dew on the fleece only, it is dry and it is dry on all the ground, then I shall know that you will save Israel by my hand. As you said, and it was so, and he arose early the next morning and wrung the fleece and from the fleece dropped enough dew to fill a pan full of water. Then Gideon said to God, indeed, I pray, do not let your anger be aroused at me and I will speak but once. I will yet make one more trial with the fleece. This time, let it be dry on the fleece and let there be dew all over the ground. And that night, God made it so on the fleece, it was completely dry, but there was dew all over the ground. Where is the Holy Spirit here? <laughs> it's like, we don't see any reference to the Holy Spirit, but this is the work of the Holy Spirit. When the fathers read this, what, what, First of all, why God responded to the second trial? I proved it to you the first time. Why, why did he ask, need to ask the second time? Because the task is big. He sees the, all of the armies against him. And he will face, he doesn't know how to face this. So he's telling God, please, if you're going to be with me, do this sign. And he's so ashamed that he has to ask for the opposite. <laughs> It's almost fun to look at it. It's like the second request is funny. It's like, can you can you reverse it? Can you know, like take the bar, the dodging bar of what happened? Take, make what dry wet and what what wet dry. Do the inversion of this, and God God did it. Where is the Holy Spirit here? So, um, I think I think it's Saint Cyril. He's a giant in the Old Testament, and I think Origen as well, scholar of Origen. He said, in the first case, the dry fleece. Sorry, the wet fleece on the dry ground is the work of the Holy Spirit in Israel. <clears throat> and all of the nations don't know God. They worship these difficultly pronounced gods, the Baz and Ashitoth and Ash Ashtaroth and all of these names of gods that the nations worship. So the Holy Spirit word that people of God have the Holy Spirit working with them, not in them. Then it got reversed. Israel became dry and the nations became wet. So the work of the Holy Spirit in Israel, they refused God. So in the New Testament, God let them be dry and the nations become enjoying the Holy Spirit. And you see here again, the water and the Holy Spirit, the linkage between them. We talked last week up in Genesis 24 when, when God chose wife for Isaac, the son of Abraham, by Abraham sending his head servant to his motherland in, in Mesopotamia. And Rebecca came by a sign that, that um, Abimelech, uh, not Abimelech, Ali Azar said, the lady that will tell me I will, I will give you water and, as you, and your camels as well, this will be the lady that's going to be the wife of Isaac. And she came with him without even seeing Isaac. But as Ali Azar met Rebecca around the well, the Holy Spirit, who guided them together, same thing as Christ met the Samaritan woman also around the well. So, and he told her that, Believe me, woman, as Christ to the Samaritan woman. Believe me, woman, now the hour will come and it is now that those who worship God will worship him in truth and spirit. The revelation of this meeting, this is a typology where some event with people happens in the Old Testament is exactly mirrored in the New Testament. So without the Old Testament, we'll not have enough, uh, maybe I'll take it back. 
the evidence to point to Christ will be so much diminished. That's why the church functioned perfectly with the Old Testament and the work of the Holy Spirit. Um, so please now, we're enjoying everything. Everything is revealed is at our fingertips. The phone is on every every device now. Uh, sorry, the, the Bible it is. So let's not um, really um, be far from the word of God. Okay, so we see in this typology, the work of the Spirit that God depleted from the Jews and get given to the nations. And we see why when we read the ministry of St. Paul, um, and, and we are one of these nations. Egypt was one of the, actually the, the symbol of Satan in the Old Testament was captivity to, um, to Egypt. Now, uh, as St. John Chrysostom comments in Matthew chapter two, where they fled to Egypt, he says, look at Egypt now by Anthony. St. John Chrysostom is talking about St. Anthony. How he made the desert is full of angels. Now he talks about the monks. Now, the end of being led by God, sorry, the, the era of being led by God will end by the people choosing an earthly king. So who is the first earthly king that the people want, not want, but he gets chosen? Is Saul. So I want us to, to jump to King Saul because he was working with the Spirit initially, and then the Holy Spirit left him. So 1 Samuel chapter 10. Um, this is a, a little bit detailed story, events that will really reveal so many things about the work of the Holy Spirit. So Sarah, can you read first, we'll read from verse 1. Okay. Yeah, actually there's two Sarahs. Sarah safe. <laughs> Then Samuel took a flask of oil and poured it on his head and kissed him and said, Is it not because the Lord has anointed your commander over his inheritance? When you have departed from me today, you will find two men by Rachel's tomb in the territory of Benjamin at Zelzah. Okay, so who got anointed? Saul. Who anointed him? Samuel. Samuel. And he anointed him to be what? To be a king. So the king is going to be doing the work of God. And I will we'll have an amazing verse coming later on when we reach this point. Um, but the point of the Holy Spirit coming on him will come in verse 6. But just to tell you, um, Saul met Samuel because Saul's dad has lost a couple of donkeys. <laughs> so Saul went out to look for the donkeys. And then in this looking for the donkeys, um, Samuel has anointed him as a king as this happens. And he, he basically, he gets a message from his dad, basically from his uncle, that his dad is telling Saul, don't worry about the donkeys, we found them. But amazingly, looking for these donkeys <laughs> made an interact, not the reason, but he interacted with, um, with Samuel and Samuel anointed him as the king, looking very strong. He, had, he was humble, he was meek, he was serving his dad. He had very, very good qualities, very good qualities. Saul did. Um, in fact, when they look for him later, he's hiding behind, in the middle of the, uh, of, the, of the luggage of the people that, that are gathered to greet him. Um, and we'll see his very humble demeanor. And then, because of his ego, because of Goliath and David's event, he will seek to kill David and, uh, and he will completely go away from the work of the Holy Spirit. But it tells us, luckily with us, it doesn't happen. The Holy Spirit never leaves us, but then we make him quiet. So let's continue with this wonderful person called Saul before he started to work against the Holy Spirit. When you have departed from me today, you will find two men by Rachel's tomb in the territory of Benjamin at Zelza, and they will say to you, the donkeys which you went to look for have been found. And now your father has ceased caring, caring about the donkeys and is worrying about you, saying, what shall I do about my son? So now the dad is asking, what is Saul? I mean, we found the donkeys, now we need to find Saul. <laughs> and you shall go on forward from there and come to the terebin tree of Tabor. There are three men going up to God at Bethel will meet you, one carrying three young goats, another carrying three loaves of bread, and another carrying a skin of wine. 
these numbers have a significance, but I will, in order to get to the point, I will leave them, but it's amazing significance for the church. But we'll just stop, continue with, in order to not lose track. And they will greet you and give you two loaves of bread, which you shall receive from their hands. After that, you shall come to the hill of God, where the Philistine garrison is. And it will happen, when you have come there to the city, that you will meet a group of prophets coming down from the high place with a stringed instrument, a tambourine, a flute, and a harp before them. And they will be prophesying, saying, Then the Spirit of the Lord will come upon you, and you will prophesy with them and be turned into another man. Wow. Let's read this verse 6 again. Can you read it again, Sarah? Then the Spirit of the Lord will come upon you, and you will prophesy with them prophesy. and prophesy, sorry, with them and be turned into another man. That's us. That is us. You'll be turned to another man. This this is a key phrase. Why the prophesying? Because we'll see an evidence of the Holy Spirit coming upon the people in the New Testament that they will prophesy as a sign, because now we don't need it. We believe in the abiding of the Holy Spirit because it's we've we've seen the evidence very early on. Well, this is what happened to, to, to him after being anointed. To show the result of the anointment, because you're a very chosen person by God, all of us are. You will get this gift just by being in, <laughs> in companionship with the people who are prophesying, which tells us in very related to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, the chapter about the resurrection. Do not be deceived, my children. Bad company corrupts good morals bad company corrupts good morals because St. Paul is giving it in the context of the resurrection you will not be able to live the resurrection if your company is with people who do not live the resurrection and look at this just human in the company of people coming down prophesying because you have received the Holy Spirit to do this task um, you will be able to prophesy with them you will be turned to another man so i want you to believe in god about yourself you are already the new person it just his image gets a little bit tarnished you don't have to be turned into anybody else you're already the new one you are already the new one the old one is buried in baptism that's our faith is no longer existing it's just your new image this new clothes that you have on the white ones that you receive in baptism sometimes they get dirt on them it's very easy there's another work of the holy spirit called the repentance and confession that why that, that wipes them clean so don't think you're, you need to be changed to another man in behavior, but not in identity. It's the beauty of it. Each one of us in identity, you are a new person. God bless you. So live in this hope that you're already, I want to say it with big caution, already saved in the sense that you are never have to do except to live in repentance in order to fulfill your salvation, to attain the kingdom of heaven. So... Don't sell yourself cheap, because the devil will make you feel that you're a bad person or whatever in the sin. Just, um, you're going to be just missing out on, on your potential. Okay, Sarah, please continue. And let it be when these signs come to you that you do as the occasion demands, for God is with you. You shall go down before me to Gilgal, and surely I will come down to you to offer burnt offerings and make sacrifices of peace offerings. Seven days you shall wait. So I come to you and show you what you should do. Exactly. So don't do anything of your mission till I meet you at Gilgal. Beth Il is the place where Jacob is running away from Esau. He slept and this is where he saw the ladder of connection between heaven and earth and the angels coming up. And he called that, that place Beth Il, God's house. Beth Il is house of God, exactly. Beth is Beth, Il is God. Um, Gilgal is one of the cities that that, that Samuel goes to them every year. There are three cities, Beth, Il, Gilgal, and there's a third one which just keeps my mind now. So these are very key places he goes to. Um, just tell you it's not haphazard that he sends them there and says, wait for me, I'll come and tell you. We have to offer these, off Samuel has to offer the offerings. Uh, wait for me there, don't do anything till I come. Okay, let's continue. So it was when he had turned his back to go from Samuel that God gave him another heart. And all those signs came to pass that day. Amazing. Another man, another heart. That's exactly us in baptism and chrismation. When they came there to the hill, there was a group of prophets to meet him. Then the Spirit of God came upon him, and he prophesied among them. And it happened when all who knew him formerly say. So 
formerly saw that he indeed prophesied among the prophets, that the people said to one another, what is this that has come upon the son of Kish? Is Saul also among the prophets? The change, the change that all of us enjoy. So please take this and put it on yourself because you received the Holy Spirit. So this is why in the Old Testament, we see the distance between us and them in terms of the grace we have. That's why Christ said that the, the one born um, from heaven is, uh, uh -huh. St. John is the greatest among the, the, the born among women, the, the, but the least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than St. John the Baptist. So, because any New Testament person has more grace than St. John the Baptist, not holier, <laughs> but by definition he is not holier by action. Because St. John the Baptist action is, is above, above all. He sits at the left hand of, of Christ and St. Mary on the right. It's the places he reserved for, for who will be on each side. But in terms of all of us as identity in Christ, St. John didn't achieve it because he was not born and baptized and chrismated like each one of us. So the angels look at you and, and just exactly say this, look at this, they see it, the angels see it. We don't see any change in the, in the person. Uh, at the time of, of Acts, you would see that speaking in tongues of, or prophesying to show us that it really is happening. But, uh, but now we take it by faith, it happened. The Holy Spirit lives in you, but you can you can tell exactly how much change we have. We couldn't believe themselves. This now among the prophets is just a normal person looking for donkeys around. <laughs> so let's continue. Then a man. Then a man from there answered and said, "But who is their father?" Therefore it became a proverb. Is Saul also among the prophets? And when he had finished prophesying, he went to the high place. Then Saul's uncle said to him and his servant, where did you go? So he said, to look for the donkeys. When we saw that they were nowhere to be found, we went to Samuel. And Saul's uncle said, tell me please what Samuel said to you. So Saul said to his uncle, he told us plainly that the donkeys had been found. But about the matter of the kingdom, he did not tell him what Samuel had said. Nice, very nice. He did not flaunt, he did not embellish, he did not show off that he's among the prophets now, or speaking among the prophets. So it tells us that the type of soul, what person he was when he worked with the Holy Spirit. And we'll see in the rest of the book of Samuel what Saul became when the Holy Spirit left him. So we don't want to really ever, ever not interact with the Holy Spirit. We have to be led by the Spirit. Let's continue. Then Samuel called the people together to the Lord at Mizpah and said to the children of Israel, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, I brought up Israel out of Egypt and delivered you from the hand of the Egyptians and from the hand of all kingdoms and from those who oppressed you. But you have today rejected your God, who himself saved you from all your adver adversities and your tribulations. And you have said to him, No set a king over us. Now therefore present yourselves before the Lord by your tribes and by your clans. Samuel is telling them what you did is not really nice to God, to put it lightly. Because he said, we don't want you as a king. You as a king for them through the judges. But then now we want an earthly king. king. But yet God acquiesced with it. And he chose for them a king. But he's teaching them also that trusting in a human, he can turn against you. As Samuel, did, as, sorry, as Saul did. As David did. He committed sins as well. But not God. Not God. He will never do this. And that's why we took Moses as an example before. When Moses went to God complaining about God, God solved the problem. He was not offended. He was offended by the people, but he was not offended by Moses telling him, I, I can't, you, you put me in a position, I just really can't handle it. And God says, sure, I'll take care of it. Thank you for coming to me. Because that's our free will. To whom do we go? To go to the serpent or we go to God? We blame God or we plead with God. So when you have a problem against God, tell him about it. You have to. He's not going to shut his ears. He's, he doesn't have our ego. When you complain about him, he, we shut our ears. We come back with, with, a, with an answer. Although he can put us in our place really well, but he doesn't because he's, he's loving. He is love. So please, please, please. The Holy Spirit who lives in you, um, when you have a problem with God, 
tell God about it. Don't, don't go to the desert. The devil will destroy. Let's continue this passage and then we'll, uh, I just want to get to this. When he gives him his rod. Yeah, is that wrong? No, no. <laughs> I'm joking like with a, you. Isn't there like a fine line? Like fine line? Meaning, meaning. You know, like if you go to God and you're like upset, you pissed off at him and you're saying, like, why are you doing this to me? And, you know, like I'm really frustrated with you. And then you think you can take that in your own hands. No, you right. can't. No, I know. But, you know, us humans, we think we can. So is that going to the devil or is that just... If it's a repre- yeah, but there are several psalms about about David telling God till well you forget me. I mean he's as- yeah. attributing attributing to God th- things that never is 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 in the character of God, never in the attributes of God. God doesn't change his personality. He's his one and all of them about love and giving and sacrificing. And we can see we can see this on the cross as a clear, clear evidence. So I go to God and just says this is too much. It, 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 the demeanor of us is is complaining that what he's allowing us to be free is too much for us. But that's a prayer. That's a prayer. We're not gonna stop. You're not gonna just complain and that's that's it. Because you tell him, help me. You put me in this, help me. This is this is great. So this is a preface of how much venting. You know, when we vent, why don't we vent with him? He can do something when nobody else can. Venting with the devil, he, he does something. He starts owning our mind bit by bit. He, he doesn't stop there because it's an invitation. Oh, you want to complain about God? Perfect. Sign me up. The accuser. But if you do this in the environment with God, guided by the Holy Spirit, then it's controlled. Then it's, it's, a, it's in a good environment. You will not stray away. Because at the very bottom end, to whom shall I go on the words of eternal life? You already know in your mind this is the end of the discussion. I still cannot go to anywhere but you. Because he, he wants us to vent. And he wants us to vent with him because you call upon me in the day of your travel, I'll deliver me and he will glorify me. This is this is one of the Psalms in Psalm 50, according to the Coptic numbering or according to the Septuagint. And because the, the repentance psalm is 50 or 51, according to the numbering. So the Lord is saying in the psalm, I have the hills, I have the birds, I have the, all of the cattle. I don't need your sacrifices. I just need one thing from you. When you're stuck, come to me. I need to find that psalm. It's an amazing psalm. Like, I don't, need, I don't need anything from you. I just need when you're stuck to come to me. That's not control. That's liberation because God doesn't control us. So in that sense, when we want to vent, we have to vent. So, whom do we went with? With Abuna and with God. Or with friends that will insert, or definitely with people. That's very, very, God wants us to have support, companions. There's so many verses in the book of Proverbs about friends, like good friends, that will stick with you on the day of your trip. And that's how you can tell which is. So we can vent with friends, because I know that they will set me straight. Like, you know, the type of friends that will give me correct verses in the right time to really set me straight. I know I'm like all over the place. I need to sit with someone. Make sense? Another question. Okay. And when Samuel had caused all the tribes of Israel to come near, the tribe of Benjamin was chosen. When he had caused the tribe of Benjamin to come near by their families, the family of Matri was chosen. And Saul, the son of Kish, was chosen. But when they sought him, he could not be found. He could, here is his humility. Here is his humility. This is the part I wanted to point us to. Where, where is he? He could not be found. He's actually hiding from this glory. Therefore they inquired of the Lord further. Has the man come here yet? And the Lord answered, there he is, hidden among the equipment. Exactly. He was hiding. He was not like flaunting it. Oh, I'm now the king. I'm about to the king or all of that stuff. So they ran and brought him from there. And when he stood among the people, he was taller than any of the people from his shoulders upward. And Samuel said to all the people, do you see him whom the Lord has chosen, that there is no one like him among all the people? Do you like your king, basically? <laughs> so basically, wait till, till we see what, what is the end. Don't look at the beginning. Um, so here is, your king. here is a very handsome king that you wanted. Do you like how he looks like? And Saul did, did not have any bad spirit in him. And you can tell when he was there to be introduced to the people, he was hiding among the equipment. This is, 
He was humble. So all the people shouted and said, Love, long live the king. Okay, let's pay attention to verse 25. That's key one. Then Samuel explained to the people the behavior of royalty and wrote it in a book and laid it up before the Lord. And Samuel sent all the people away, every man to his house. Okay, that's important. In, in another translation, then Samuel told the people the very same verse. And we'll end with this verse. It's 830, 831. Then Samuel told the people the rights and duties of the kingship. And he wrote them in a book and laid it up before the Lord. So you notice in every ordination, this, 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 I, I noticed this just today. He wrote to the people the rights and duties of the royalty. Here is the royalty, but means the king. In the, in the marriage, there is instruction. In the ordination of deacons, there is instruction of what is, what are the duties, whatever the rank is. Absaltus or Moses, or in the deacon's rank, the subdeacon and the deacon and the, and the archdeacon. Um, and you get these roles also when you get baptized because there are certain commandments given to the parents if you're a child. Uh, how do they raise the person in the right behavior after, as, a, as, a, as entrusted uh, people with, with the person who's now um, born from above? So this is the, Samuel told the people, Samuel told the parent, parents, Samuel told the priest, Samuel told the deacon, um, the bishop, the metropolitan, whatever, the rights and duties. This is associated with his role as a king now. He is not just to be hailed. No, he has rights and he has duties as well. And this is what the church does with every single rank and every single office um, that, that we do. When, when people take a different role. We see it in the, in the wedding, because this is now a new role. That's why they wear the same thing they wore in baptism, this sash across, carrying the, 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 the cross of Christ, because this is, again, a new role where the, these two Christians will, will carry on. And they has to be read for them what is their rights and what are their duties in this, um, in this new office. So we see when we describe the role of the Old Testament, and when we read the Old Testament, not just as stories, we see in it everything that we do in the Old Testament, in the New Testament, of course, not the salvation, but uh, the typology and the allegory to the salvation. And we'll continue um, from, um, in first, we'll, after this we'll go to, unfortunately, the, the Spirit of God will depart from, from Saul. Glory to God the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, one God. Let's pray together. Thank you. Oh, my pleasure.